Okay, well, welcome everybody to the Northwest Quantum Nexus uh, seminar series. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, to welcome you uh, to our monthly event. And um, if you're joining us for the first time, please be sure to check out the Northwest Quantum Nexus website, um, where you'll see a list of all of the upcoming uh, seminar speakers. Uh, my name is Nathan Baker, and uh, before I introduce uh, Andrew today, I wanted to um, uh, go through uh, some quick uh, administrivia. Uh, the first is that this seminar is being recorded, so if you're attending this meeting, you may appear as an attendee in the recording, and your questions and comments in the Q&A will also be part of the recording. So that's just an FYI, and if uh, that disturbs you, um, please please feel free to disconnect now. Also, uh, the NQN has a code of conduct for our seminar series and for our events. Uh, we're dedicated to providing a respectful, friendly, professional experience for everyone, uh, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, physical appearance, age, race, or religion. We do not tolerate any behavior that's harassing or degrading to any individual in any form, and individuals are responsible for knowing and abiding by these standards. We encourage everyone to assist in creating a welcoming and safe environment, and we refuse the right to uh, reserve the right to refuse admittance or remove any person from an event at any time at our discretion. So, so with that, um, our our speaker this month is Andrew Childs from the uh, University of Maryland. Uh, he received his doctorate in physics from MIT with Eddie Farhi in 2004, and then moved to uh, uh, to a postdoctoral fellowship, the DeBridge Postdoctoral Scholar. Uh, with Preskill at Caltech from 2004 to 2007, and then as a, uh, became a faculty member um, at the Institute for Quantum Computing at the University of Waterloo. He was there until 2014 when he moved to University of Maryland, where he serves as uh, the co-director of QUICS and is a professor in the Department of Computer Science and the Institute for Advanced Computer Studies. He probably needs no introduction. He's a very well-known uh, uh, name in this field and has done some outstanding work. So I'm very excited to uh, to turn this over to uh, Andrew and uh, to hear about the, the, his latest research. Okay, yeah, thanks very much uh, for the introduction. Um, do I need to do something to share my slides again? Yes, please go ahead and share and I will send it live. Um, okay, here we go. Okay, can you see the slides? Yes. Excellent. Okay, yeah, thanks. So thanks very much for, for the introduction and for the opportunity to tell you about uh, some of our research. So I'd like to tell you about this project, uh, which is joint work with my co-authors uh, who are shown here, Jinpeng, Herman, Nuno, Hari, and Constantina. Uh, and this is work, well, you can find this work described in the in the preprint um, whose uh, number is shown here. And this is a, a quantum algorithm for uh, nonlinear differential equations. So um, actually we'll talk both about quantum algorithms and also about limitations on quantum algorithms for this uh, for this kind of problem. All right, so let's get started. Okay, so um, just as a, as a kind of very basic introduction to the subject, I'm sure many of you are sort of familiar with the idea of quantum computing, uh, but but uh, you know, as you as you probably know, um, the general idea is that if we store information in quantum states and then process that information quantum mechanically, sometimes we can solve problems dramatically faster than we could using classical computers or non-quantum computers. Uh, and you know, there are some problems for which we uh, we have an exponential speed up, or we think we have an exponential speed up, maybe over the best known uh, classical algorithms, or at least a super polynomial speed up. Uh, and this includes you know problems related to cryptanalysis, uh, but also other problems in mathematics. Um, also, the very basic problem of uh, you know simulating quantum mechanics, which is related to the the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. There are also you know, other, other problems for which we get uh, perhaps less speed up, maybe a polynomial speed up over classical computation, um, but this includes a much broader, a much broader class of problems. So um, you know, there are many sort of interesting things you, you can potentially do if you're willing to, uh, you know, if you're satisfied with, with um, a less significant speed up over classical computation. Okay, so the work that I wanna tell you about today is um, you know, about specifically about quantum algorithms for problems in numerical analysis. Uh, and this is an area that's, you know, really kind of opened up over the last, I don't know, 10 years or so um, through this idea of representing um, the solutions of sort of, um, you know, high dimensional linear algebra problems in Hilbert space. So using the quantum state uh, to represent uh, some high dimensional vector in a very succinct way, right? So in principle, we can represent some vector in an n dimensional space by a quantum state of only log n qubits. 
Um, now, of course, having that state is not the same thing as having an explicit classical description of the vector. So this is a very different kind of representation, and the sort of information that you can get from such a representation is uh, certainly limited. And so, you know, I'll talk about this, um, uh, you know, as as we go along in both sort of the previous work and also in our work, what this what this means. So it's important to be to be aware that when we talk about quantum algorithms for for linear equations or differential equations, you know, in the sense of this talk, um, it's not it's not in the same sense as if you have a vector stored in in memory in MATLAB, uh, for example. Um, but you know, that being said, in this representation where you store vectors as quantum states, you can potentially do some things much faster. Uh, in principle, you can imagine in some cases being able to prepare such a state with a number of operations that's only polynomial in the number of qubits, polynomial in the log of the dimension of the space. Um, and so this is a lot faster. And so if you can find something useful to do with such a, such a representation of your solution, then that can be, um, you know, potentially very useful. OK, so uh, as I mentioned, you know, this this topic of sort of quantum algorithms for linear algebra and Hilbert space is uh, intimately connected with this idea of quantum simulation. So let me uh, now kind of give a bit of an, an, introduction, an introduction to this subject. Uh, so quantum simulation, as you as you maybe know, is like, um, you know, one of the uh, earliest uh, ap potential applications of quantum computers that was that was recognized. In fact, it was this idea that maybe if you made a quantum mechanical computer, it would be a useful thing for simulating um, for simulating quantum systems. This was like the the idea that gave rise to um, just the concept of a quantum computer in the first place. Starting with you know uh, people thinking you know already in the early 1980s um, about this this kind of computationally dif computational difficulty of simulating quantum physics uh, on classical computers. Um, so the kind of problem that we're sort of thinking about is is really the problem of simulating the dynamics of a of a quantum system. So we've got some description of the Hamiltonian the Permission operator that describes the uh, energy levels and also the dy dynamics of a quantum system. There's some time that we want to evolve for. We have some initial state psi of zero that's just you know supplied on our quantum computer. It's it's you know sitting there in the memory of our quantum device. And our goal is to produce an encoding of the final state psi of t on our quantum device. So again, this is in the spirit of like you know producing as the output of the computation um, a, a, a vector encoded in a quantum state. In this case, it really just is the quantum state. Uh, that you want to produce, and um, we want to do that up to you know some desired error tolerance. So this is a problem that you know because we're talking about producing this this vector you know in the memory of a quantum computer, um, you know this is something that we can't even hope to to represent efficiently on a classical computer. So uh, it's sort of hopeless to give to try to give efficient algorithms for this task classically. Um, you know, if we would try to to give an explicit representation of the state, that would just require an exponentially large amount of memory. Um, on the other hand, of course, the quantum computer is not producing a complete description of the state, as I've as I've been emphasizing already. But if you can prepare such a state, the state that you get by evolving some, you know, potentially complicated quantum Hamiltonian, you can use that output state to answer questions that would be classically hard to answer. In particular, in this framework, you could simulate the operation of a universal quantum device. So this problem is actually as hard as anything that a quantum computer could do. Uh, in the kind of complexity theory jargon, we say this is a BQP hard problem. So if you think that factoring is a hard problem, then this is a hard problem. But actually, this problem is probably, you know, somehow even maybe harder than factoring. This is like uh, as hard as a problem can be uh, that a quantum computer can efficiently solve. OK, so quantum simulation has a lot of applications, potentially. One you know, kind of interesting direction is to think about using it directly to simulate the physics of quantum mechanical systems, like in quantum chemistry or condensed matter physics or high energy physics. Um, but you can also think about this idea of quantum simulation as a technique for um, you know, developing other quantum algorithms. Uh, so um, you know, there, there are a variety of algorithms, some of which maybe you've heard about, like adiabatic optimization, quantum walk algorithms, algorithms for evaluating formulas, um, you know, that all sort of are algorithms for problems that have no obvious direct connection to, to quantum mechanics, but, but somehow, um, you know, can be solved by simulating some appropriate quantum mechanical dynamics. And these, these uh, algorithms having to do with, you know, performing linear algebra in Hilbert space um, are of this flavor. And so that's that's what we're going to talk about today. OK, so um, the kind of workhorse for, for these algorithms is this uh, idea of what what is sometimes called the quantum linear systems algorithm um, that was discovered by Harrow, Hassidim and Lloyd now um, a little bit over 10 years ago. 
Um, so the problem that they're interested in is, is you know, the problem of um, solving a system of, of linear equations. So let's say we have n linear equations in n unknowns. They're specified by an equation like this, ax equals b. Uh, and our goal is to, um, you know, find the solution x, which is like a inverse applied to the right hand side b, right? So let's imagine that a is invertible. So this is a um, well-defined thing. Now, clearly, like if we want to solve this problem classically, or if we want to solve it quantumly, and our goal is to write down explicitly the vector x, then we're going to need linear time in the dimension because, you know, it takes that, that amount of time just to write out the, the answer. Um, but now what we can do is we can change the model, right? We can think about this setting that I've been talking about where, um, you know, the solution will be encoded into a quantum state, not as an explicit complete description of all of the entries of the vector. So, you know, in this, um, in this setting, um, you know, where, where our goal is to produce the vector, if we make some other assumptions, then that's actually something that we can do. Um, we can actually produce that vector efficiently. So let's imagine that we can prepare the right-hand side of this system of linear equations, um, you know, as a, as a uh, quantum state. So we can prepare a normalized quantum state that's proportional to that vector B. So that's what I mean here by ket B. And also, you know, we, we need some kind of appropriate access to the system of equations. Um, this is not maybe the, the uh, most general thing one could consider, but, you know, one natural kind of setting is that let's say the matrix is sparse, so there's not too many entries in any, uh, too many non-zero entries in any row or column, and we're given a black box that lets us figure out where the non-zero entries are and what those, what those values are in any given row or column. So if we have that kind of information, then um, we can do a Hamiltonian simulation that kind of corresponds to the matrix A, and we can use that to actually um, efficiently produce the vector X. Now, when I say efficiently, what's the, what's the time complexity? So you can do this in time that's polynomial in the number of qubits that you're using to represent the vector, so polynomial in the log of the dimension. Um, th also, that's polynomial in the inverse of the error, and there has to be some dependence on somehow how far from singular the matrix is, and you can quantify that in terms of what's called the condition number, which is um, denote, which is denoted kappa and shown here. And the com the running time of the algorithm is is also polynomial in this condition number. Okay, so you know I'm not going to sort of get into uh, many of the details about how this algorithm works. We're basically going to use this as a subroutine in the in the kind of um, algorithms for differential equations. If you know a bit about quantum computing, the main idea of, of this algorithm, as it was originally formulated, um, is to do um, you know, some kind of uh, phase estimation procedure to estimate the eigenvalues of A. So you do phase estimation on this Hamiltonian simulation, uh, you know, corresponding to A, and then you somehow manually put in the inverse of those eigenvalues uh, to sort of implement this operator A inverse. And that's a procedure which you can't do deterministically because, you know, in general, these dynamics are not unitary, but uh, you can do it with post-selection and it will succeed with reasonable probability, you know, if, if uh, the condition number is not too big. So this is how the, the sort of complexity of this original algorithm as it was first formulated. Now it turns out that you can you can sort of optimize the, you, know, you can improve the performance of these algorithms somewhat. In particular, you can get complexity that goes, you know, that's polynomial in the log of one over epsilon, which is an exponential improvement over what's, uh, what's stated here. Um, and you can make the dependence on the condition number linear, whereas it was quadratic in the, in the original algorithm. Um, these, these improvements are not, um, you know, super important for the application we're gonna talk about today, but, you know, um, there's been, quite a bit of work now on these algorithms for uh, quantum algorithms for producing these quantum encodings of the solutions of linear systems. And uh, it's now a you know, pretty well understood problem. Okay, so, um, so now how can we use this quantum linear systems idea to give quantum algorithms for differential equations? Um, well, so uh, here's the kind of problem that we're interested in. So imagine, you know, to, to get things started, let's think about systems of linear differential equations. This is still kind of, you know, prior work to the uh, to the stuff that I'm that I'm mainly talking about today. So let's imagine that we have a system of linear differential equations. dx dt is, you know, uh, so these are first order equations. If you have higher order, you know, derivatives with respect to time, you could always introduce additional variables to, you know, make them into a system of first order equations. So let's imagine that we have this kind of, uh, you know, uh, system of first order linear differential equations. dx dt is ax plus b. Um, and we have some initial conditions. So, you know, let's talk here about initial value problems. Uh, and our goal is to determine the solution x of t that you get by, you know, running these dynamics for some given time capital T. Okay, so this is clearly some kind of a generalization of the problem of Hamiltonian simulation, right? Hamiltonian simulation is the case where this is the Schrodinger equation. So then A is like an anti-Hermitian operator, like it's minus I times the, the Hamiltonian. 
Um, and of course, B would be zero, like there's no inhomogeneity in the in the Schrodinger equation. Um, so, but in that particular case, you would have unitary dynamics, and this would be, um, you know, the case that we've already discussed, how you can give, uh, you know, uh, efficient algorithms to, to uh, on a quantum computer produce the state vector that would be, um, you know, generated by the Schrodinger evolution. So that's um, something that's kind of very well understood. But now what if you have non-unitary dynamics? What if you have, you know, you're interested in an equation like this where it's not just the Schrodinger equation, it's not just the equations of quantum mechanics, but rather it's some more general, you know, linear uh, system of linear differential equations. Well, you can you can handle such a case using this quantum linear systems algorithm. And this was first pointed out in a nice paper by Dominic Berry from 2014. Um, so the sort of main idea um, that he sort of realized you could do uh, is the following. So first of all, um, you know, we can handle such a system of differential equations in very much the way that we would if we were giving a sort of um, classical, you know, numerical algorithm for integrating a system of differential equations. Uh, namely, we discretize in time. So if you use something like a kind of finite difference method to discretize in time, then you're going to get effectively some system of linear equations that describes how the, you know, eventual time evolved state is related to the, the input. Right. So when you discretize in time, basically you get a large system of, uh, you know, linear equations whose solution gives you an approximation of the, the dynamics of the differential equation. Uh, and, and that's basically the idea. You, you, you sort of uh, define that linear system and then you um, solve that system in the sense of this quantum linear systems algorithm. Right. So that allows you to produce the quantum state proportional to the solution of the system of linear equations. And then from that, you can extract the solution, you know, which here we're encoding as a quantum state proportional to X of T. So there are a lot of details in sort of understanding, you know, the, the complexity of, of that approach when you sort of look at the cost of running this, uh, this quantum linear systems algorithm. Um, it, uh, you know, basically you, you have to understand things like what is the condition number of that system as a function of, you know, parameters of this system of differential equations, because, you know, as we saw in the last slide, that's going to impact the uh, complexity of the quantum linear system algorithm. Um, you know, how well is this, is this, um, you know, final state going to approximate the, um, you know, the ideal state, right? Now there's, there's going to be sort of error from the fact that the quantum linear system algorithm is approximate, but there's also going to be error from the fact that you've done this finite difference approximation, right? So that's something you also have to control. You know, also these procedures will not succeed deterministically because you're trying to do something that's not unitary. So you're going to have to rely on some post-selection uh, to make to make things succeed. And, um, you know, because of that, uh, you know, yeah, you, you won't succeed perfectly. Uh, and, and you want to understand sort of like um, what is going to be the, um, uh, you know, how likely will the algorithm be to succeed? And then how many times will you have to repeat, you know, to be confident that you've produced a solution, um, which is, you know, the, the one that you're looking for. So those are all details that you can understand. Uh, and when you sort of, you know, work out all those details, you can show that you get an algorithm for this, uh, for this problem that, um, you know, allows you to produce this quantum state proportional to X of T. Um, of course, this algorithm comes with, you know, all of these caveats for the quantum uh, linear systems algorithm in general. You need to have a suitable implicit description of the system that allows you to do this corresponding, uh, you know, Hamiltonian evolution uh, corresponding to the, uh, not the matrix A, but the discretized system of linear equations. You need to be able to produce the input state, you know, as a quantum state. And at the end of the day, you only produce a quantum encoding of the solution, which is not the same thing as producing an explicit description. So, but, you know, modulo those caveats, this gives you an algorithm for differential equations, you know, in this kind of quantum mechanical sense. Um, it's now no longer relying on the dynamics being unitary. Okay, so now another sort of like um, caveat that's sort of related to, you know, what happens when you sort of try to work out the complexity of this procedure is that, you um, it's definitely important for this algorithm to be efficient that the norm of the solution had better not decay exponentially. And this is because, you know, sort of post-selecting on very unlikely outcomes uh, is computationally hard, right? If you could post-select on, uh, you know, exponentially small, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, pieces of the quantum state, you could use that to solve uh, like NP hard problems and in fact, even, even harder problems. So, um, it, you know, it can't be that you can do this post-selection efficiently if the if the state decays away to something exponentially small. Um, and uh, so, you know, 
if you if you consider the case where you have just like a completely arbitrary system of, of uh, differential equations that might have some uh, exponential decay, uh, you know, the algorithm cannot be efficient. So there has to be some condition for efficiency of the algorithm that has to do with how the solution uh, can decay. And we'll see this issue when we talk about the case of, of nonlinear differential equations in a bit. Um, now, the algorithm that I've described is kind of like, you know, uh, simplified. We just talked about initial value problems and uh, constant coefficients and you know if this is a system of ordinary differential equations but there's a lot of work that's been done to generalize these kinds of ideas to think about you know partial differential equations boundary value problems making the coefficients time dependent there's been a lot of work to optimize the performance of this algorithm uh, to in some cases give you know really produce the, the this output state with complexity um, it's like poly log one over epsilon um, as we, as we know we can do for, for um, systems of linear equations in general. So there's a lot of work that's been done to give, uh, you know, really kind of optimized algorithms. Okay, but so now the, the sort of main topic of this talk is to think about um, uh, the generalization to nonlinear equations, to nonlinear differential equations. So what about that case? You know, what, what could we say about a system of differential equations that's nonlinear? OK, well, actually, it turns out that in, in fact, even before, um, you know, uh, Dominic Berry wrote down this algorithm for this quantum algorithm for um, linear differential equations, there was a proposal to give an algorithm for nonlinear differential equations. Um, and in fact, this paper appeared like only like months after the, um, you know, this paper of Harrow, Hassidim and Lloyd was, uh, you know, came out. Um, and, and so what what um, these folks, Leighton and Osborne proposed um, was, you know, that maybe you could do the same thing for a high dimensional system of, you know, even nonlinear differential equations um, and give an algorithm whose complexity, uh, you know, to produce a quantum encoding of the solution um, is again only like logarithmic in the dimension. And in fact, they showed how to do this, um, which is, you know, fantastic. But on the other hand, if you want to integrate the system of equations for an, an amount of time t, then um, the complexity of the algorithm scales exponentially in t. So that means that really you can only hope to use this algorithm for very short evolution times, uh, you know, before somehow the complexity, you know, kind of completely blows up. And, and it basically means that, you know, there's, there's kind of very little that you can do with this algorithm. You know, you can only sort of evolve for a really short time uh, before the cost is just, uh, is just prohibitive. Um, so the main idea of this algorithm is that, you know, somehow you can use multiple copies of the solution to represent nonlinearities. Like if you have a polynomial nonlinearity, non uh, you know, kind of a degree K, then you can use K copies of the solution to implement that nonlinearity. Um, but there's a problem, and this is the reason that their algorithm has, you know, complexity exponential in T, um, which is that these copies are going to be used up as you do the evolution. Like you're going to make use of these copies to uh, figure out you know what what dynamics to introduce, and you're gonna you know make, you're gonna use them up, um, and so you might think, well, okay, just just keep making copies as you as you need them. You use up some of the copies, but make some more. Um, but the problem is that you can't do that, right? There's this thing called the no cloning theorem that says that you can't make uh, you can't make copies of quantum states uh, in in general, and so. Um, what that means is that if you want to have copies of the of the of the um, state, you need to sort of maintain all those copies throughout the algorithm. Um, but since you're using up these copies all the time, this leads to an exponential overhead, right? And this is exactly where this exponential and t overhead comes from in their algorithm: the need for all of these copies of the state. Um, and and now you might think, well, okay, maybe we could do um, you know better by somehow approaching the problem differently. But you know, you probably quickly realize that if you really want to give um, efficient algorithms for nonlinear dynamics in general, you know, maybe that just shouldn't be possible. Um, there are many, uh, you know, sort of um, kind of hard computational problems that you could potentially solve by implementing nonlinear dynamics. Um, you know, these dynamics are just hard in general. One sort of way that sort of I know about that where this has come up is in um, sort of nonlinear modifications of quantum mechanics, right? So quantum mechanics, of course, is linear, but there have been proposals for, you know, uh, possible nonlinear modifications of the equations of of the equations of quantum mechanics, um, but you can show that if you have you know even very weak nonlinearities in quantum mechanics, um, even sort of keeping the dynamics unitary so the quantum state remains normalized, but sort of allowing uh, quantum state vectors to evolve in some nonlinear way, um, you know this can if you have this this feature, it allows it can allow you to solve some computational problems very fast. Like you can, you know, rapidly solve the, the unstructured search problem, which is hard, you know, within sort of ordinary, you know, linear quantum mechanics. 
Um, so because of this, actually, you know, maybe this is just a fundamental obstacle, right? Maybe we just can't hope to have efficient algorithms for nonlinear dynamics. I mean, actually, I think that's just true in general um, that that, um, you know, because you can do some really hard things with certain kinds of nonlinear dynamics, there just shouldn't be an efficient quantum algorithm for uh, nonlinear dynamics in general. Uh, and so maybe, you know, maybe what we have is the best that we can hope for and maybe we should just you know sort of not not push anymore but it turns out that actually there is something interesting you can do if you sort of formulate the problem in the right way so you know we can't sort of hope to to handle general nonlinear dynamics but you know then again by the way like our algorithm wasn't for, for even for linear differential equations wasn't efficient in general right there was some condition that the norm of the solution should not decay exponentially um, and so, you know, maybe if we impose some conditions, we can actually give efficient algorithms. So let's let's think about how we can sort of formulate um, a sort of problem having to do with nonlinear dynamics, where maybe there's some parameter that, that allows us to understand a regime in which we actually can give an efficient algorithm. And, you know, this is basically what, what we have done and, and what I want to tell you about. OK, so here's a kind of, um, you know, possibly more complicated than it needs to be, uh, you know, statement of the of the problem that we're going to try to approach. So we're going to think specifically about um, uh, sort of a system of quadratic nonlinear differential equations. So it'll be quadratic in the, the variable. So here U is a vector. It's like an N component vector. Um, and the way we represent this polynomial nonlinearity here is through this idea of having two copies of the solution, right? So you can represent a quadratic nonlinearity uh, if you have a piece of the of the equations that look that has two copies of the solution, and then there's going to be this rectangular matrix F2 that's going to describe the kind of quadratic piece of the evolution. There's also going to be a linear piece of the evolution, and there can be an inhomogeneity as well. And in fact, we even allow the inhomogeneity to be to be time dependent. We'll assume that that F1 and F2 are time independent. You know, we could talk later about you know whether that can be generalized. Maybe it can, but uh, let's imagine for at least for simplicity that those are time independent. But the this um, you know driving can be potentially uh, time dependent. Okay, and then um, we're given some kind of let me may not maybe not dwell on the details, but we're given some kind of um, appropriate succinct description of this system of equations that's going to be sufficient to allow us to sort of um, do what we need to do with the quantum linear systems algorithm. Um, and then we're going to need to have some conditions. And the kind of really crucial thing for the algorithm to be efficient uh, is going to be that we have to have some dissipation, right? So um, this is why in the title of the talk, there was this thing about dissipative nonlinear differential equations. So the idea is that we want to have strong enough dissipation that it somehow keeps the nonlinearity under control, that somehow, you know, things are not allowed, the nonlinearity is not allowed to, you know, let things um, grow too far out of control because there's, there's going to be some dissipation that's keeping it in check, but you can still have some, you know, potentially interesting nonlinear effects. And so the way that we control this, um, this dissipation is through this, um, is through the eigenvalues of this linear piece, right? So F1 describe, describes the linear piece of the dynamics. And uh, what we want is that, so first of all, this should be, this, these linear dynamics should be dissipated. So the, any of the real parts of the eigenvalues of F1 should be negative, right? So that means there's gonna, they're gonna correspond to some you know, exponential decay. There's gonna be no sort of um, stable part or exponential growth part. Um, and furthermore, we want the kind of um, largest of these neg negative eigenvalues, the one that's closest to zero, to be not too, uh, not too large. We, we, want, we want sort of everything to be decaying. Um, and we're gonna measure the size of that thing relative to um, the nonlinearity, so that's captured here by the spectral norm of the this matrix capturing the, the nonlinear part of the evolution, and also the forcing term, the this inhomogeneity. Right, so we want we want uh, the dissipation to be sufficiently strong relative to uh, this norm of F2 and norm of F0. Um, and our goal is going to be to produce a quantum state proportional to the, you know, the final state of these dynamics when we evolve for some time, uh, capital T. And we're going to be interested in the complexity of doing that as a function of this parameter, capital R. OK, so, you know, you can think about this parameter R, as I was saying, it quantifies the sort of relative strength of, um, you know, um, dissipation and the nonlinearity and the, the driving. Um, and it's kind of qualitatively similar, but not exactly the same as the, the Reynolds number in fluid dynamics. So that also says something about the kind of, you know, relative strength of sort of nonlinear effects and dissipative effects. So, um, yeah, this quantity R is, is, is somehow something like the Reynolds number. OK, so now what are we able to say about this about this problem? So we have kind of two main results. The first result is an algorithmic result saying we actually can can you know solve this problem in some regime efficiently. 
And the other main result is sort of a lower bound showing that there's a limitation that, you know, we can't always hope to solve this problem efficiently. So let me start with the, the algorithm. Okay, so what we show is that if this parameter R is less than one, then there's an efficient quantum algorithm for the problem. Specifically, there's an algorithm whose complexity goes like, uh, basically like the square of the evolution time, well, times some additional log factors. Um, it's gonna scale like one over the error um, that sort of, you know, this epsilon quantifies the error in the in the vector that you produce. Um, it scales linearly with the sparsity. Um, it scales, as we want to be the case, logarithmically with the dimension of the uh, system that we're trying to solve. And it also scales with this parameter Q. So Q quantifies the decay of the solution. So remember I said that like even in the case of linear differential equations, you know, we can't hope to handle the case where the solution decays away exponentially. So Q basically just measures, you know, how much has the solution decayed? And, um, you know, if the solution hasn't decayed too much, then Q is not too big. And then this, you know, algorithm can potentially be efficient. Okay, so I mean, I'm not going to um, sort of describe a lot of the details about how this algorithm works, but let me, I'm going to sort of focus on the first of these ingredients, um, which is kind of the main, the main um, kind of new thing in this algorithm that's kind of different from how things work in algorithms for linear differential equations. This is the idea of what's called Carleman linearization. So I'll, I'll explain this on the next slide. Uh, Carleman linearization is basically a way of taking this given system of nonlinear differential equations and relating it to a system of linear differential equations, but actually, you know, many more. So if you start out with finitely many, um, you know, uh, nonlinear differential equations, you'll get infinitely many linear differential equations that describe the same, the same dynamics. Uh, and then our goal is going to be to try to solve those. Of course, we can't solve a system of infinitely many equations. You know, we have to truncate it. Uh, and so we'll have to show that by truncating that system, we can still get a reasonable approximation of what's going on. So we have to do some kind of convergence analysis. And this is maybe the sort of newest thing that we do in the analysis of this algorithm. Um, then once you do that, you get a system of linear differential equations, and then you can sort of approach that using sort of standard methods for, you know, giving quantum algorithms for linear differential equations. And you have to do all the kind of stuff that you would usually do. You know, you can discretize that, that um, system in time. You've got to do things like figure out how to prepare the initial state for the kind of resulting linear system. Um, you know, you've got to analyze the condition number, the success probability of the procedure, et cetera. These details I'm really not going to talk about anymore, but they basically proceed along the same kinds of lines. I mean, there's work to do, but they basically proceed along the same kinds of lines as what you would do for, uh, you know, algorithms for linear differential equations. Okay. So um, let me say a little bit about Carleman linearization to give you an idea of sort of what of what's going on under the hood uh, in this algorithm, you know, to get it to um, the quantum linear systems problem. Okay, so the idea of Carleman linearization, which is, you know, an old idea that's, uh, you know, been around for, for a long time. I think it's it's not actually used so much as a kind of a practical numerical method, uh, but, it's, but it's maybe more useful for us, you know, algorithmically here in the context of, of quantum computing, but it's been considered certainly, you know, um, for a long time. Um, the idea is to approximate, as, as, I said, as I said before, approximate the system of uh, nonlinear differential equations by an infinite sequence of linear differential equations. And specifically, they will be equations in like tensor powers of the solution vector u. So again, this is like using this idea of, you know, considering copies of the solution, multiple copies of the solution to represent nonlinearities. OK, so um, let me do like a really simple example to show what's going on just in the case where we have a we have a scalar equation. Right. So in general here, u is a vector, but let's imagine that u is just a scalar. Right. So so we let's say we just have this this, you know, generic quadratic uh, differential equation that says du dt is a u squared plus b times u plus c. OK, so that's our that's our quadratic differential equation. Um, now, we would like to relate that to a system of linear differential equations. And the idea is that we can think about it as a linear equation, um, a system of linear equations in the powers of u, right? So if we would think about u squared as like another variable in its own right, then, you know, um, we could introduce that into its system. And now if u and u squared are like independent things, then um, you could potentially actually have just like um, something linear. But of course, the problem is that if you want to do that, you need to know what's the derivative of u squared. But of course, you can do that, you know, just using just using your, you know, uh, familiar calculus, just, you know, applying the, the chain rule here, right? So like, um, given this equation, we can write, you know, du squared dt is just two times u times du dt. And that's just given by this, if we plug in, you know, this expression for du, du dt. And this is now um, an expression for how, you know, u squared should evolve in time. 
which now is you know linear in u and u squared, if we think about u squared as a separate thing, but of course now it introduces u cubed, right? So um, if we want to somehow um, you know keep doing this, now we need to maybe declare u cubed to be its own thing and work out its dynamics, and we can keep doing this, right? So we, we could do this again and again and again, this process would never terminate, we would get this infinite sequence of linear differential equations. Okay, but so that's not, um, you know, that's not going to be sort of like, you know, having an infinite system of equations is not going to be useful. We have to truncate, right? See, so the idea will be that we were going to cut off this procedure after some finite number of steps. And, um, you know, we want to understand how far do we have to truncate to get an approximation that's accurate to within some desired amount. So here, what's written here is like uh, what this system looks like if you truncate at capital N levels. Um, you know, in, in the case where now we have like not scalar equations, but we have vector equations. And here these are equations in these new variables like yj, which are supposed to be, you know, they're sort of standing in for like, you know, j copies of the solution u. So this is what the system of equations look like, looks like. And then what you have to do is you have to show that the solution of this gives you a good, this, you know, linear system of equations gives you a good approximation of the system of, you know, the original system of nonlinear differential equations. And you know you can do that, and I won't I won't get into the details here, but you can do that, and you can show that it suffices to take n that actually grows only logarithmically um, with the evolution time and with a bunch of other parameters. So there's you know definitely work to be done to show this kind of thing, but um, uh, yeah, it's all explained in the paper. Okay, so that's sort of the first main result. Let me now explain the second main result, which is the, the lower bound. So the second result says something about the actually the hardness of this problem. So for the for the um, you know the the algorithm to be efficient, we needed this parameter r to be less than one. So what about larger values of r? You know, could we could we maybe improve the analysis to give algorithms for larger values of r that are still efficient? Um, well, maybe a little bit, but not too much, right? So what our second result says is that um, if r is bigger than the square root of two, so like not that much bigger than one, then already there's an instance of the of this uh, you know quadratic ODE problem that I defined uh, previously, um, such that you know there does not exist an efficient algorithm for the problem. Any algorithm for this problem has to have worst case complexity that's exponential in the um, time that you want to evolve for. Um, now, as I mentioned before, um, there there already are sort of results that show, show that that the dynamics of like you know nonlinear quantum mechanics um, can be hard to simulate. But that doesn't show this kind of a result because you know that's for models without dissipation, right? The state vector kind of always remains, uh, you know, exactly normalized. So there's no there's no dissipation in those models. Um, so uh, you know what's sort of new here is that we can show that this is the case even even under some dissipation. You know, as long as that dissipation is not too strong, as long as there's sort of enough nonlinearity, then still you can sort of take advantage of that nonlinearity to solve hard problems. You know, if you could work out what these dynamics are. Um, and what that means is you shouldn't be able to do that, right? Because you shouldn't be able to solve those hard problems. Okay, so um, what are the sort of main ingredients in this, uh, in the argument for showing this? Um, well, first of all, we use sort of the hardness of distinguishing non-orthogonal quantum states, right? If you have two quantum states that are really close to each other, you shouldn't be able to distinguish them with a very high probability. Or if you're allowed to produce, you know, multiple copies of these states, you should need to produce a large number of copies before you can make them. Uh, you know, before they become very distinguishable, you know, before you before you have a situation where you can actually distinguish which state you have. Um, and but on the other hand, if you can implement nonlinear dynamics, you can use that to drive apart states that are initially close to each other. Right. Uh, you can't do this, obviously, in quantum mechanics because quantum mechanics is unitary. Things just sort of move around without angles changing. But if you have nonlinear dynamics, then you can, you know, you can push vectors apart. Um, and so you can show that you can do this with a quadratic, you know, uh, sort of system of differential equations. Uh, and if this parameter satisfies, you know, r bigger than root two, then you can sort of, uh, you know, um, you can push the states apart kind of, um, you know, exponentially fast. Uh, and that's what gives you this kind of contradiction with the sort of hardness of, of um, state distinguishability. Um, so yeah, so um, let me just kind of briefly outline sort of what goes into these arguments. So, so first of all, state distinguishability, I mean, it's, it's sort of like well known that it's hard to distinguish 
um, you know, non-orthogonal quantum states, or you, you just you can't succeed uh, in distinguishing non-orthogonal states with very high probability. So, you know, in particular, if you imagine that you've got a box that's going to give you a state, and every time you press the button on the box, it's either going to give you some state psi, or it's going to give you some state phi. Like it, it's the same state that comes out every time you press the button, but you don't know whether it's going to give you a psi or a phi. Um, then, you know, if psi and phi are really close, in other words, if, you know, the inner product between psi and phi has magnitude one minus epsilon, where epsilon is very small, then it's going to, you're going to have to press the button on the box a lot of times before you can work out whether it's a psi box or a phi box. So specifically, if the, if the overlap is like one minus epsilon, then you need to, to press the button like one over epsilon times. Um, so yeah, this, this follows kind of straightforwardly from just kind of like basic uh, kind of quantum information arguments, looking at sort of the trace distance between the states that you produce and this kind of like Hellstrom bound that says how hard it is to distinguish, uh, you know, quantum states as a function of how close they are to each other. Okay, but now the sort of like uh, maybe, uh, you know, the, the place where the nonlinearity comes in is, is that, you know, if you can implement nonlinear dynamics, you can use that to push apart states that are close to each other. Um, so we can show this as follows. So um, we want to do this, you know, we want to quantify this as a function of this parameter r. So let's consider this very simple, you know, scalar quadratic differential equation. du dt is minus u plus r u squared, where r is this parameter. This is a this is an equation that has, you know, this this quantity r, um, uh, you know, plays the role that it did before, right? Because the kind of the strength of the dissipation is is one, right? The eigenvalue, the 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 negative eigenvalue uh, here of the linear piece is minus one. Um, and and so the strength of the quadratic piece relative to that is R. OK, um, so now what happens when you run this differential equation? Well, you know, it's nonlinear, but this is actually a differential equation whose solution you can write down explicitly. You know, it's this. That's the solution of the of the differential equation. Um, and so in particular, it has this, you know, exponential change as a function of, of time. Maybe not so surprising. Um, and now let's see what happens if we let this thing act on both basis states of a qubit. Um, so we're going to consider just like some dynamics in some two-dimensional space, and it's going to be like diagonal. Like this is going to be the dynamics that act on each of the two, uh, you know, basis states. Well, then if we start with a plus state, uh, so uniform superposition of zero and one, since the same thing is happening to the two amplitudes and the two amplitudes, you know, start out the same, that state will not evolve, you know, up to normalization. Um, but on the other hand, if you deviate a little bit from that state, then the sort of amplitudes can change relative to each other exponentially fast in T because you have this exponential change in T. Um, and so like, you know, here's a plot showing what happens. Let's say we take R to be exactly the square root of two and theta is like some small rotation away from this, you know, pi over four. So we rotate away by, you know, this angle 0.01. Um, so then, you know, one of these amplitudes is a little bit above one over the uh, square root of two. The other one is a little bit below one over the square root of two. And what's going to happen is that the one above is going to grow exponentially and the one below is going to decay exponentially. And so you can start out with like exponentially close amplitudes, but then in only polynomial, polynomial time, they can separate from each other by a constant amount so that you can sort of reliably distinguish this state from the plus state. Okay. All right, so that's how we can sort of use these kinds of equations uh, to sort of distinguish non-orthogonal states. So if we had a quantum algorithm for, you know, solving this, um, you know, nonlinear differential equation problem on a quantum computer, it would allow us to, to do this, you know, task that shouldn't be possible, uh, and therefore there shouldn't be an efficient algorithm for this problem. Uh, and you can do this, you know, you can show that you can do this whenever r is bigger than the square root of two. Uh, okay, great. Okay, so those, that, those are sort of our main two results, and now uh, I want to talk a little bit, just very briefly, about some potential applications of these kinds of ideas. And the first one is uh, maybe relevant to our, um, you know, maybe not super relevant, but uh, relevant in, in, in uh, some way to sort of uh, our, our kind of modern lives um, through, uh, you know, the sort of problem of the dynamics of a pandemic. Um, so, you know, you could write down a model of what happens when you have a, you know, population of individuals um, interacting with each other in a pandemic. Um, you know, using a system of nonlinear differential equations. And so this is a standard model um, used by, you know, I guess, you know, like computational epidemiologists to model things like the dynamics of COVID. Actually, I mean, you know, we sort of like looked at um, this kind of a model in a, in a recent paper um, that sort of, you know, specifically uses it to model the, um, the, the dynamics of the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is not like a model that we made up. Um, 
you know, I don't want to get into a lot of the details, but uh, because of course I, I don't, you know, completely understand all the details, but, um, you know, the, the basic idea of this model is that it divides up the population into different pieces, the, the susceptible part, the exposed part, the infected part, and the recovered part. And then these components all interact with each other with a bunch of coefficients that have to do with, you know, new members entering the population, the rate of vaccination, the rate at which the disease is transmitted, you know, et cetera. Um, and uh, so you can write down and, you know, epidemiologists have written down, uh, you know, models, uh, a model like this and used it to try to, you know, make predictions about what's going to happen as you as you vary these parameters. Um, and so if you take realistic parameters like this is from some, you know, paper from the past year that, you know, looked at this in the context of COVID-19, um, you can set those parameters in such a way that um, you actually satisfy this condition. That there's not too strong a nonlinearity. Um, you have to assume a fairly rapid vaccination, probably certainly faster than we're, we're currently achieving right now, but you can make the, the parameters like not totally unrealistic uh, and be in this regime where the nonlinearity is not too strong. And um, of course, this model that's written down here has only four variables. So like, you know, the, the whole advantage of the quantum algorithm is supposed to be that we can consider really high dimensional systems. So it's, it's you know, probably not so useful if we only have four variables. But uh, in principle, if you want to model, let's say, you know, um, many interacting cities, you could imagine wanting to, to study some higher dimensional version of this problem. Uh, in fact, again, these things have been written down by people who, who model these kinds of things. Um, so, you know, uh, I don't want to say that this is, you know, this is going to be the sort of, uh, you know, this is going to be a really crucial ingredient in sort of understanding the dynamics of pandemics. Uh, I'm not sure how, like, practical this actually is, but, um, you know, I just want to say that, it, you know, it's it's uh, uh, it's certainly in the ballpark of the kind of thing that you can imagine potentially feeding to uh, to this algorithm. So maybe it's worth thinking more about, you know, how useful it would really be. The other kind of application, main application that we looked at, I mean, there's lots of places, obviously, where nonlinear dynamics show up, but the other kind of place we looked is in, is in fluid dynamics. And specifically, we looked uh, at the case of this thing called the forced viscous Burgers equation, which is some kind of maybe, you know, toy version of the Navier-Stokes equations for, for fluid dynamics. Um, and, you know, this is, of course, uh, a partial differential equation, but you can discretize space to get uh, an ODE that you can, you can try to solve to understand the, the dynamics of this system. And, um, you know, the sort of main thing I want to point out is that with some, you know, kind of, uh, you, you can make some kind of uh, reasonable choice of parameters um, for which you can sort of see numerically that it seems like this Carleman method is actually converging quite well, even though R is much larger than one. So while our theorem says that, you know, if you want, you want to have a general uh, convergence guarantee for the, for the algorithm, you know, we need R to be less than one. Of course, it could be that for certain systems of equations, um, you know, not for the one where we construct our, our counterexample, but for certain systems of, of equations, you could potentially have good performance even for larger values of R. And we have some evidence that that's the case for this kind of, you know, fluid dynamics example. So that, you know, suggests that there may be, um, you know, perhaps if you sort of look at more features of a particular problem, you can you can potentially have an efficient algorithm, you know, even sort of deep, deeper into the nonlinear regime, which I think is something that kind of needs more study. Okay, so uh, let me let me wrap up and then I'll say say a little bit about some uh, open questions. So, um, you know, what we've shown in this work is that we can uh, give an efficient quantum algorithm for producing this quantum encoding of the solution of a system of nonlinear equations, provided there's enough dissipation. So we need to have strong enough dissipation relative to the nonlinearity and the forcing term, uh, the sort of inhomogeneity in the in the system of equations, um, and we also you know, have this other condition that the solution need not decay exponentially, the solution needs to not decay uh, exponentially for the algorithm to be efficient. Um, so, you know, you could ask, like, with all of these, um, you know, caveats that I've mentioned, is this problem, you know, actually um, of interest? Is this really something that's that's hard for a classical computer? Or maybe with all of these, you know, extra conditions, you could actually do this classically. Um, but certainly the kind of general problem that we solve is not one that can be handled classically. I mean, already the linear case uh, is, as I mentioned before, you know, even the case of quantum mechanics is BQP complete, right? So differential equations in general, if you want to try to sort of solve them in this sense of producing a quantum encoding of the solution, that's a problem that's as hard as anything that a quantum computer can do. So this problem is definitely, you know, the problem that we solve is definitely a classically hard problem in full generality. You know, the sort of interesting question, I think, is to identify cases where you can really use this algorithm to say something interesting about some particular problem. That's, of course, uh, you know, a more challenging thing to address, but um, uh, certainly some instances of the problem that we look at are classically hard. 
Now, there is this restriction that you need to, um, you know, not have exponential decay for the algorithm to be efficient. And this is just, you know, non-negotiable. This is just the way that it is. Um, now, notice that if we don't have a driving term, right? So if we don't have this kind of forcing, we don't have any, uh, so if we, if we have an, a homogeneous system of differential equations, then um, because we have to have dissipation, the solution has to decay asymptotically. And so what that means is that you can't have an efficient algorithm, you know, for long time dynamics, um, or, or at least our algorithm isn't efficient for, for long time dynamics. But, um, you know, it still could be that um, you could have efficient algorithms for the sort of, you know, long time dynamics in the case with forcing, because once you have a forcing term, you know, even one that's not too strong, it can sort of keep the, the solution alive, keep it from decaying exponentially. Uh, and then, um, you know, this, this condition doesn't mean that the algorithm you know, has to be inefficient. You can potentially have cases where the algorithm, you know, runs in polynomial time. Um, okay, that's what I just said. So we've also shown that somehow this, uh, you know, R less than one is something that can't be improved significantly, at least for generic nonlinear differential equations, uh, because we showed this hardness result when R is at least the square root of two. Um, but we also have this numerical evidence, you know, suggesting that for some problems, maybe you can handle much larger values of R. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's, I think that's kind of intriguing. Okay, so let me just uh, conclude by mentioning some open questions. Um, you know, there's some kind of obvious ones, you know, that are maybe of the more sort of technical variety, right? So there's this window between R equals one and R equals square root of two where we don't uh, quite, we haven't quite pinned down the complexity of this problem in general. It would be nice to kind of, you know, uh, fill in that gap one way or the other. Um, our, our algorithm has complexity quadratic in T. You know, I think there are reasons why we can't expect it to be better than linear in T, but again, there's a gap between, uh, you know, linear and quadratic that would be interesting to understand. Um, you know, there are many quantum algorithms for these kinds of problems that have complexity logarithmic in the inverse error, whereas we only have complexity going like one over epsilon. So that's again, a sort of thing that would be nice to improve. Um, but sort of looking at the bigger picture, you know, I think it would be really interesting to understand this question of like when the algorithm can be efficient, even though R is bigger than one. Um, and, and probably really the most significant thing I think to, to think about is really using this algorithm in, you know, like end to end applications. So, you know, we just talked about the subroutine of producing the quantum state that encodes the solution. But of course, that's not the same thing as I, as I was emphasizing at the beginning, you know, it's not the same thing as producing a complete description of the state. So, you know, you can try to make quantum measurements on such a state to extract, uh, you know, um, expectations or correlations that maybe tell you interesting things about the solution. But, you know, um, sort of describing the details of how you would do that in the context of some particular application and how you could use this algorithm to answer some, you know, uh, you know, something interesting that you would like to understand about fluid flow or um, the dynamics of some population or, you know, something else that's described by nonlinear equations, um, you know, I think is something that, that we definitely need to, to work more to understand, as I think we also need to understand even in the case of, uh, you know, linear differential equations and, and, you know, frankly, even in the case of quantum simulation, I think more can be done uh, to understand that, that question. Okay, so thanks very much for your uh, for your attention and and for the opportunity to give the talk, and I'm I'm happy to answer some questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, there's no applause button on here, but I'm sure people are applauding silently in their offices and homes. So uh, we have <coughs> a few questions that have come through on the chat. Um, I have one as well. Uh, so uh, let's start with. Um, with the one in the chat. So uh, sure. someone asked, can you generalize this algorithm to the Navier-Stokes equation? And if so, how how does it perform compared with the traditional finite difference method? Yeah, so I mean, I think, uh, I don't know when this question, well, okay, yeah. So, I mean, I think, um, you know, I think this kind of is, um, you know, essentially what we were doing here, right? So, I mean, I guess here we're looking specifically at this kind of Berger's equation, but I think if you looked at the kind of full on, you know, Navier-Stokes, I think you could do the same kind of thing. Uh, you know, basically you would have to be in the regime where the Reynolds number is not too large for the algorithm to be efficient, but under some condition, you know, which basically would be that the Reynolds number is not too large, uh, you know, you could handle it. Now, I mean, as in this example that I discussed here, you know, these are like partial differential equations. So you would have to, you know, consider the spatial discretization and, uh, you know, work out some details about like, you know, how, how finely do you have to discretize in space to get, um, you know, to get a good approximation. Um, there's definitely things to think about, um, 
but uh, but in principle, you know, to try to to try to apply this um, this approach, you could definitely do. Um, so there was this question. You know, part of the question was the comparison to the traditional finite difference method. I mean, I think you would be doing some finite difference approximation. Um, you know, in the in you know in the description of this algorithm, right? Like you could you could implement the spatial derivatives with some finite difference approximation. You know, you could look into what happens if you use higher order approximations versus the lowest order finite difference approximation to see how much effect that has on the eventual complexity. These are the kinds of things one would have to to work to understand. But I think I think the ideas of sort of finite differences would be, um, you know, would be in there. If you're asking how this compares to sort of really classical methods, I mean, it's it's somehow really apples and oranges, right? Because here we have a much more succinct representation, but also we we produce, you know, not the same kind of description of the solution. So um, great. Yeah. I've got another one in here. Um, okay. Are there any ways the recent preconditioning results could be used to improve performance? And similarly, is it straightforward to generalize the problem to the time dependent case? They ask because it might be cool to use interaction picture ideas for nonlinear equations. Yes. So, um, uh, yeah. So let's see. I guess I'm not sure specifically which uh, you know preconditioning results the the um, uh, question is about, but um, I mean I think. Um, you know, uh, you know, whenever you have a way of somehow like, um, you know, um, adjusting the, the, um, your description of the linear system to get a better condition number, this can in principle, uh, you know, give you better performance. So one can imagine, um, yeah, one can imagine doing that for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this kind of thing has been done in the case of, for example, you know, um, uh, algorithms for linear partial differential equations. Like I don't, I don't see any reason why why it couldn't in principle be done here. Uh, as for the, the sort of like time dependent case, I mean, so our you know our, our setting is already time dependent in the sense that we have time dependent uh, forcing, right? So we have um, we have time dependent. Um, oh, where's the description of the problem? We have a time dependent you know forcing term, so we allow this to be time dependent. But we you know we have these parts being time independent. Um, I don't think there should be a fundamental obstacle to sort of making these things time dependent, but it definitely would change the um, it def definitely would change the um, sort of nature of the problem a bit, and uh, it would make the analysis a little bit more complicated. So I feel like it's something that ought to be doable, but we you know we haven't done this in the in the paper as it you know currently is on the archive. Okay. Um, we're getting short on time. Uh, the questions keep coming in, so whenever you want to tap out, let me know and we'll be done. Okay. Uh, but the next question is, uh, you mentioned that nonlinear quantum dynamics can help solve some problems. What is known about the fundamental linearity of quantum mechanics and at what level are nonlinearities allowed by current experiments? Oh, uh, that's a great question, uh, and, but one that I that I can't really answer because I think um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just I just know, don't know the status of sort of attempts to do experiments to um, uh, sort of, you know, probe nonlinearities in quantum mechanics. I mean, my feeling is that somehow, you know, really like the quantum mechanics should be exactly linear. But of course, you should do experiments, I guess, to try to put bounds on that, you know, in a quantitative way. Um, yeah, it would be super surprising if the, if one could detect any nonlinearity because even a little bit, you know, really lets you do um, outlandish things computationally. But I, I just don't know anything about the status of, of experiments to probe this. Okay. Um, another question. Uh, so, the you, you talked about the Karlman approach, and Karlman matrices are sort of at least sort somewhat uh, related to the Koopman operator type expansions of nonlinear operators. Can can you say a little bit about uh, how you're? I mean, what you're doing seems like a composition approach. And so, can you think of other composition approaches that might be nearby that would sort of build off of what you've done here? Yeah, I, I I don't know. I guess I mean I'm not familiar with that particular sort of like Koopman approach, and I um, uh, you know I'm I'm sort of more on the quantum algorithm side of things, and I have co-authors who know more about uh, uh, you know some of these numerical methods. Fortunately, um, you know there there is another approach that's described in a, a paper from a different group that sort of um, you know um, relates. Um, sort of the dynamics of nonlinear systems of nonlinear equations to something like nonlinear Schrodinger equations, um, uh, but I'm not I'm not really sort of um, you know familiar with all of the details of that approach. There are not a lot of details given in the preprint that describes that, so um, I, I can't really say more about that. I mean, you know, one could definitely imagine sort of trying to to take an, another approach to make things better. There is this, of course, limitation that you know if you make uh, you know r too big, the problem just becomes computationally hard. So no amount of tweaking or changing the approach, uh, you know, is going to give you something that's efficient. 
Okay, great. Well, uh, we're a little bit over time, so um, why don't we wrap up there? Uh, I want to thank Andrew again, and um, for those of you who have tuned in for the first time, uh, please do check out the uh, nwquantum.com, uh, the Northwest Quantum Nexus uh, website for seminar series uh, updates, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the chance to speak. Have a good one. Bye. You too.